I'm not actually presenting about my PhD research, my a &E research. I'm presenting about stuff that I started doing as a volunteer and ended up doing um, as a consultant kind of internationally. So this is very much the citizen side of things in terms of, yes, I am now Dr. Calix and thanks for being my first ever audience as a doctor. Um, but I'm very much talking about things that affect me as a citizen and I guess we're moving from charismatic animals to natural disasters and natural disasters are inherently engaging for people that are affected. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to get into a couple of examples that are focused on volunteer geographic information. Um, I've tailored this a bit to what I saw at the conference yesterday and this morning, um, what I thought would kind of be relevant and useful. And um, VGI, is, as a kind of hashtag or something to search on Google Scholar, is a kind of subset of citizen science that we haven't heard much about. But if you um, are on Google Scholar and looking at VGI motivations, um, VGI... Um, a lot of the keywords that you would use with citizen science, there's a whole kind of world of research there that's worth thinking about. So how did I kind of end up in this space? Um, I started volunteering with OpenStreetMap in 2013, I think, for um, kind of my own benefit rather than in kind of any humanitarian or disaster scenario. Um, and that's because I was living in Asia and I found that Google Maps was wrong a lot of the time and it was not very helpful. And so I found OpenStreetMap as an alternative, which is much better in a lot of places that have English as a second language or just in not the United, St United States or Europe. Um, and so, I, yeah, like a lot of people, I started using it in the, the place that I was living to, um, to basically update the maps and get that satisfaction. We've heard from various people in projects, that satisfaction of having something that you do and you can see it immediately and then I could share that map with people, like say I had friends coming to stay, I'd be like, okay, here's the directions from that hostel to the place we're meeting, and here's a map that's actually accurate. Because you, you do an edit in Google Maps and you don't, it get, has to get approved by somebody, may or may not get accepted, you don't have much control. Um, in my abstract, I talked about design principles. One of the values, of, one of the good things about OpenStreetMap that makes it really valuable for humanitarian work and disaster response contexts is that it's massively distributed. There's lots of copies, it's very open. It has an open database license. Um, you can download tiles of kind of anywhere in the world for your own projects if you really want to host you know, your own copy of a thing. Um, but it can kind of be shared very easily um, and is very open and that is a big thing in disaster response situations when we don't necessarily know what's going to happen and who's going to be in control or still be able to do things, I guess. So that's how I got involved. Um, and then turns out that having these massive, these open maps are really valuable in disaster context. So pretty much everyone involved with OpenStreetMap are volunteers, but there are some humanitarian OpenStreetMap team staff who kind of coordinate projects that are specifically about disaster response. I'm going to talk in a couple of minutes about a project, a specific citizen science project I was employed through um, that used OpenStreetMaps. But just to touch on, Missing Maps is a project associated with OpenStreetMap that is very much directly linking NGOs to people doing um, volunteer satellite imagery work. So you can either do OpenStreetMap where it's your community, you know, you, look, you know, you can fill in information, or use satellite imagery to trace things. And this is really important in places there's not many people or people don't have internet access. So volunteers, I was involved when I was working in Geneva in some university kind of hackathon type things, mapathons, where people will trace satellite imagery that's been donated from various places or open um, into OpenStreetMap so that then usually Red Cross or Médecins Sans Frontières have a map when they're going to places on the ground. So it's very applied. Um, yeah, and so there's the remote volunteer um, kind of inputting of information based on satellite imagery. And then there's also community volunteers adding local detail. And there's community volunteers in places like, you know, Australia and Germany and stuff who have the resources and, and background to do that. And there's other places that don't so much. So in 2016, I was working in Vanuatu with communities on some kind of food security and disaster resilient stuff. Um, this is an example from Pango Village, which is not that far from the capital. We were mapping things like food security. So you see the food gardens up in the corner, the marine reserve. You can't see water points at this level. But this kind of information is really useful because then in a disaster situation, 
um, different organizations can see, okay, if there's damage to this area, this is really going to affect the community. It might look like there's no houses there. Maybe that doesn't seem like a priority, but if that's actually where people get their food from, we really need to make sure that we address that or provide food for that community. So I think that I'm already a few minutes in. So I spent six months in Geneva, based inside CERN, which was amazing, um, working on this project. And Geotag X builds on OpenStreetMap, and the Geotag X part of it is, it was about geotagging. X can be anything. So any kind of disaster scenario, um, in theory, can be on this platform. I just wanted to highlight, because we've heard a lot about BioCollect and um, Digibol and those kind of things. This project um, is built on Pybossa. When this happened, like when this was happening in 2014, Pybossa was kind of emerging. Pybossa is now the basis for crowdcrafting and more recently Scifabric, which I don't know too much about, but I know that they're platforms that are um, able to be used. Pybossa has been used also for light pollution, citizen science projects, and forest canopy monitoring in Brazil. So that's another alternative. It's based on Python um, language for anyone who does some coding, which can be great as well if you know like PhD students, because Python is a really useful language to have in your skill set. Um, but actually making the modules is pretty much just JavaScript, because that's about the level of tech that I have. And just to give you a couple of examples, um, one of the big projects that we were working on was about the Yamuna River in India. And there were different modules. So things like, so kind of moved on from the, the geographic information to imagery analysis. So we've heard about this. The, the um, structure of these is quite similar to um, wildlife collect, the ABC slash Digivol thing we've heard about earlier. So I won't go into that too much. If you do want more info on the design and coding side of these things, um, I published a book chapter last year in my old name, so Smith, Kobe Smith, um, about that. So I won't go into that too much. But um, we worked with NGOs on the ground in places to decide for them what the priorities were about what needed to be addressed and what wasn't already being addressed, I guess, in existing projects. And so there's things like where the flood levels are and stuff, actually linking that to imagery, not just basing it on expert analyses, um, and where there's really bad pollution that needs to be cleaned up afterwards, so longer term cleanup stuff, as well as floods and things that are obvious natural disasters. I was working in the UN when the um, Ebola outbreak happened and there was this UN-wide response. They were like, if you can do anything to do with this, do something. So I worked with a couple of people to make a module about that, about pro personal protective equipment, because aid, work aid workers were dying because they weren't using the right protective equipment. Um, and, you know, is that a natural disaster? Not entirely, but climate change, things like this are getting worse, potentially. And then things like drought that are, um, yeah, natural disasters. Um, and I guess I highlight this one as well, because there's a lot of projects that we've been hearing about that are about you know, plant biodiversity, air, water, this kind of data. I'm going to move in now to talking about some principles of how you might share data or consider um, getting into kind of humanitarian assistance space. And these kind of data sets can be really valuable, particularly for longer term recovery efforts. So one of the things that I wanted to highlight that hasn't really come up um, is some of the international data repositories um, that allow some of the data that citizen science projects in Australia could contribute to. The Humanitarian Data Exchange is one of those. Um, I'm not going to talk much about how important it is for data to be open um, in order to be shared and useful in these kind of contexts. I hope that's kind of obvious, but it's really useful to clearly label that your data is open and available for reuse in other contexts so that then they can be used in these kind of scenarios. So the Humanitarian Data Exchange um, has some different UN agencies involved as well as NGOs and, and universities and things. It doesn't, it has raw data sets, it has kind of finished things. So if you have an analysis that you think could be useful in some kind of disaster response context, um, you can share it there. It's not just citizen science. I was working within UNOSAT, which is based in CERN, and they had like, professional mappers who did these disaster response type maps. So there's these kind of things, plus you can have citizen science outputs. It's not, not very limited. Um, not going to go into it, but in terms of the data sharing, there's been a lot of conversations because the humanitarian data space is so diverse, 
some diverse and, and organize, different organizations are doing different things in different ways. There's been a lot of discussions about how to make sure that the information is clearly labeled and easy for different organizations to understand what that information means and is useful for. In science, there's kind of different areas of science have their own language, I guess, and that's kind of quite standardized. It's not the case in humanitarian spaces. What they've kind of been working towards, arguably based on social media, is using hashtags to identify information categories. So this is just to give you a bit of a flavor of the kind of information that is typically used in disaster response, some of which overlaps with the kind of stuff that will be in um, yeah, citizen science projects, particularly like water, air information, um, yeah, when we lose species diversity after fires or floods or anything like that. But they're, they're moving towards kind of hashtags as a way of doing that because it's just kind of how people have started sharing this information. I'm not sure it's the best ever way, but if you're going to be sharing information, it's useful to think about including this as just a field, like if you're sharing it as an Excel spreadsheet, have a column or a, or a row that just tags what that kind of information is. That's what they're kind of suggesting. Um, I touched on Hybossa. I just also wanted to highlight um, Kobo Toolbox as a thing that is similar to, for example, BioCollector and things like that, but um, has been a really good tool that I've used, for example, in Vanuatu, and is free if you have kind of a kind of any kind of humanitarian spin to your project or doing kind of social <laughs> science stuff then it's quite intuitive. It is designed for use in low internet environments so that you can save stuff offline. And I just wanted to throw it into the mix of this conference so that there's a little bit of awareness within kind of AXA and stuff that it's out there. Um, when I went to Uni Melbourne, it was one of the things that we were working on at research platforms to raise awareness of amongst digital humanities researchers. And I, yeah, I think it's a really good tool that um, is worth having on your radar as an alternative to the ones that we've heard about in the conference so far. So, sorry to kind of race through these things, um, but I chose a very wide scoped topic and then was trying to tailor it to what is relevant to this conference. So I guess I'd rather let questions dictate where we go from here rather than kind of add more information. So over to you guys.